right? And another thing is, <laughs> and another thing, <laughs> okay. damn it. <laughs> That's going to be the intro. Okay, Las Vegas actors and filmmakers, and we are interviewing Paul Campanella. And uh, this is the very first one. So, thank you. Right. I appreciate you doing this for well, us. It's great having me here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, great. Well, listen. Uh, tell us, uh, tell us about who you are, what you've done, you know, so we can. Um, I'm Paul X Campanella. That's my professional name. Okay. Uh, I'm an actor, uh, filmmaker, producer, director. I'm also a musician, singer, and um, that's what I do. All of those things. I love the whole process of being creative in all those ways. Right. Now, you said musician and singer. And I know from knowing you for many, many years uh, back on the East Coast. That that's something that you've done pretty much all your life. Mm -hmm. uh, so tell us about that. Like, how did that come about, and what made you um, create a career in that for most of your life until right. recently? Well, I mean, started off as a kid. Obviously, like many my age, uh, it was the Beatles. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the minute we saw them on the Ed Sullivan Show, we said, "I want to do that." And um, <clears throat> so my music career be began way back then, and, and has continued through even to today. In fact, as a shameless plug, I do have a gig next week at Lucille's at Red Rock on <laughs> Saturday, January 30th. But anyway, um, so, yeah, so I, you know, it was all through the years. I continued to work and continued to perform uh, from a musical perspective. Always been interested in acting, always been interested in filmmaking. Mm -hmm. um, gone to the movies, you know, my whole life and loved it. Always used to watch the behind-the-scenes stuff mm -hmm. when that started to, become available to watch on DVDs it, yeah, and all that right? on DVDs or VHS whatever it was mm -hmm. so um, you know just through the years it became a situation where I got more and more and more interested and I started to see film mm -hmm. as a medium where all of those creative influences can be actually combined into one product you know where you have the acting the producing the filmmaking the directing the camera work the music the, you know, the, the soundtrack, right. all of those being used to generate or to elicit from an audience an emotional reaction. Mm -hmm. You know, the biggest kick I get out of any type of performing is to actually elicit an emotional reaction from the audience. Mm -hmm. So I found that film um, seems to satisfy all of that in one single product. You know? Seems like a natural evolution. Right, yeah, exactly. Can you remember your first... Uh, experience in theater or film. Your first professional experience. Yeah, my first my first experience in theater was in high school. Yeah. Um, we did a high school play, and it was "You Can't Take It With You," a play by Moss Hart. Okay. And believe it or not, I played the IRS tax collector. <laughs> so it was fun. I loved the experience. I loved the camaraderie of the theater. Yeah. Um, and then really didn't do too much after that because more than anything. Immediately after high school, my musical career really became a full-time thing. Uh -huh. So I didn't do too much theater, but eventually evolved through the music, going into what was then known as a show band, where we had a band that, you know, you would do what was called dance sets, and then you would also do a show set. Uh -huh. So in the show sets, we moved into stuff like comedy on stage. You know, oh, and, I see, I see. And, and sort of even a little bit of improvisation with the audience, the banter back and forth, or banter back and forth between the band members. Uh -huh. So what what was the show really was the comedic element of it. So that started that little portion yeah. of things happening. Uh, and then basically, you know, just continued on through music there, but had a family. Uh, Felt an obligation to get a real job because mm -hmm. <laughs> we had bills to pay. But always kept my fingers in the mix. Always kept my hands in the pie. Mm -hmm. um, so never really stopped playing at any point in time. And, um, and basically that's sort of how the evolution of all this happened. Right. Um, right. And continued on that path. But I found as I was looking for work, as I was looking through the Craigslist ads and all that stuff, uh -huh. that... There seemed to be a lot of work for actors, which I did not know initially coming out here, that mm -hmm. that was going to be the case. Mm -hmm. So just for the hell of it, again, I went on a few auditions, and my first audition for a feature film, I got the lead bad guy role. And which film was that? That was called Heroes. Okay. Uh, Malcolm Brooks' uh, film. 
And that's back in 2006? Yeah, we actually started filming in February of 2006, mm-hmm. I think. Um, but yeah, so then I got more work, and then I auditioned for Tony and Tina's Wedding. Mm-hmm. And I actually auditioned for that twice, and then finally got the call in uh, July of 2006, come on board. Yeah. And that's a lead role, that was a lead role of Tony's dad, Nunzio. And stayed with that show for eight years, I think, and over a thousand shows. Wow. So, so you, you basically came out and sort of fell into boot camp, basically. Yeah. As far, you know, as far as uh, for an actor. All, it, although it sounds like um, back in Buffalo, you already had that sort of through the music career, right. um, you know, mixing up the sort of stage performance with uh, the comedy and all that that mm-hmm. you just mentioned. You kind of already had a boot camp. I mean, were you were you aware at that time that that it was kind of a boot camp for you, or did, did you recognize later on that no. how how that might have uh, come into play later on, and how that might have prepped you? I've for... only just realized that the last few years how everything that I did, you know, as a young performer mm-hmm. um, back in Buffalo has really informed how I perform today. And even how I write, like I, I also write screenplays and stuff. Okay. So even how I write, the knowledge that I had from working my day jobs, things like I was a cab driver. Yeah. I was an insurance salesman. Okay. I was a, uh, uh, in telephone sales for technology. <clears throat> you know, so all that stuff has informed everything that I do, right. from writing to performing to even even today using improvisational techniques, which came from what we first did in the show bands. You know, as as far as interacting with the audience, so yeah, it's 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 all informed that. Um, and even Buffalo, or just before I left, maybe a couple of years, I had gotten the theater bug again. Mm-hmm. And if you remember Studio Arena Theater, which I was do. a highly respected theater, New York actors used to come up to Buffalo all the time to do plays mm-hmm. there. Uh, they had an adult um, theater group. Or Class, slash training class. Gotcha. Yeah. And I went to there for, for a while um, just to kind of get my feet back in it and see where I was. You and know? How, how long were you in that? I don't actually remember. It, it, was a, it wasn't it was something long. It wasn't like a year or anything. It may have been literally maybe a month or two intermittently because I just I sort of wanted to get a feel for... Just enough know, to get the bug. Yeah. Kind of like do I want to do this? Right. What are they... You know, what's it like now as opposed to when I first started? Mm. So... So it was all there. It's all been, all that time was all planting seeds within me and and learning and growing and then just having all that history to be available for what I do today. Right. You know, and it's always a learning process. It's constant. It never stops. Yeah, that seems to be the case when you you talk to people about this kind of stuff is that it's a continual learning process, right? So um, on that note, how do you feel, well, what is your thought about... um, let me back up. Does it? Do you ever get the impression or feel that it seems like people today, new people coming on the scene, um, they have a different sense of what the work ethic should be, or they may ha- might have different expectations about um, sort of the the gratification or the payoff that comes by getting involved. I mean, like when I talk to someone like you, it sounds like you've been doing this for years and years and years and years, and there's been a lot of work into it. Whether it was you, know, you were directly aware that there was an end goal of you know being a film actor or, or a writer in mind. The the work was always there, mm-hmm. and it, I don't know if you notice, but it seems like a lot of people today they have this expectation of sort of an instant gratification. Right. They want to you know they go to an acting class for a couple of weeks or, or a month, or um, they, they want to you know be in you know you know how it is now. There's mm-hmm. there's a gazillion short films everywhere. Right. Everybody's a director and all this kind of thing. Right. That Everybody's got a of, camera. It's more available. <clears throat> right. It seems more uh, prolific today than obviously way back, you know, when we were back in Buffalo. But uh, what, without being long-winded about that, what, what are your thoughts about that? What are your... Well, as you know, I, I teach acting for the camera. I should say I coach. I don't like to use the word teach. I prefer okay. to use the word coach. I have a little thing called the Actors Lab uh, over on St. Rose and Eastern, and I have a great group of actors who are really dedicated. Mm-hmm. They come every time they can. It's a core group of anywhere from, you know, six to eight people, depending on you know who's in town, who's available to do what. But yeah. Um, but to to go back to your original question about the work ethic, uh, yeah, being a film actor is challenging work. It's long hours when you're on set. 
I saw a uh, behind the scenes thing the other day about Keanu Reeves mm -hmm. and the movie that he did called John Wick. Yes. Which they're now doing a sequel for. And a friend of mine who's a stunt person and also in, a client of mine and coach that I coach, uh, Jay, uh, is a stunt person. And he just worked with Keanu in New York. And Keanu, it really works hard, especially when it comes to his stunts. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I only bring this up because, again, we're talking about work ethic. Right. In the behind the scenes thing that I watched on the making of the first John Wick, mm -hmm. he jokingly you know, held up his arm. He was wearing a T-shirt for the scene. Mm -hmm. He had bruises like you wouldn't believe. It looked like insect bites all over his arm. I mean, they were just... He was covered in it. Stomach, ribs. I mean, it was it was wow. like brutal. It was like he just got out of the cage with a yeah. fighter. Yeah. You know? And he was joking about it. But everyone who works with him have said they, you cannot believe his work ethic, especially when it comes to him doing his own stunts because he wants to do them yeah. He wants the audience to feel that, you know, the character is, he is who the character is. Right. But beyond that, it's it's really, um, it's an emotional process. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> it's a lot of work. It's a lot of understanding psychology. And that's where I think a lot of young people who come into the business don't even think about. They just think you go out and you, you act. Right. Or they <laughs> or, think if they have a certain look that they could just walk in. And yeah, exactly. And in some cases... That's true. Yeah. Some people may, who make film today, um, yeah. you know, the look is the look. They want, okay, I want, I want that girl because she looks the way I want her to look. Mm -hmm. doesn't matter if she can act, right. you know. And eventually it'll, it shows up in the final product. But um, the look is important. Um, but, yes, I think they do have an unexpected um, perception of what work it really does take to do a good job and to really perform well for the camera. Yeah. And to really m connect with the audience, mm -hmm. okay. Um, so what is so what is that process like for you as an actor? Like, do you have a process that you do when when you get a role for it, depending on whether it's a short or a feature or whatever it is? Like, yes. Oh, yeah. You have to. Um, there's a there's a there's a there's a couple things. There's a system in, in which you break down a scene for what you would do for say for an audition. Mm -hmm. So obviously the typical. Um, road that you take to getting a role is first you have to get the call for the audition. And that's going to depend on your look, your gender, and your age range. Right. Okay, so they're looking at all, you know, 800 submissions, and they're going to just pick the people that look like they can do it. So you, the, the first thing is going to be the look. The second thing is you get the audition, you break down the scene, mm -hmm. using every single bit of information that the writer has given you. Whether it's in the in the breakdown of the character when they send it to you initially, or whether it's in the actual script itself. So let's say you get it just maybe it's one scene that you're auditioning with, mm -hmm. and it's a page and a half. I will spend probably about six hours in total working on that page and a half. I will have before I go into the audition room in some way, shape, or manner, I will have run that scene about two hundred times. Wow. Okay. okay. And what do you do when you when you're running a scene? Like, what does that mean? Like, okay. What you... So what I'll do, just that I'll give you an example of the process. First, I break down the scene, and that's part of the big thing that we work at at the actors lab is mm -hmm. showing them how to break down the scene, what what to look for in a scene, what to figure out. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, what does my character want? The intention. Why do I want it? Right. And what happens if I don't get it? That's just a simple part of the breakdown. Right, right. In actuality, there's about 20 steps that I go through in a breakdown. Okay. Um, so you break it down. After I've broken it down, then I start to just I keep reading it over and over again and just sort of get the DNA of the scene in, into me, into my brain. Then what I'll do is I will take a recorder. Everybody pretty much has a voice recorder on their right. phones. I will record the off-camera dialogue. In other words, the other person's right, dialogue right, right. without my dialogue mm -hmm. in there. And then I just run the scene with that. through that over and over again. So, as an example, that, that I'll do most of that when I'm driving to L.A. for the audition. Okay. You know, so that'll be just rolling through my head. So by the time I get into the room, um, hopefully I'm in a state where I'm in the moment. Yeah. And now... 
all I'm doing is simply reacting to what the to other, the reader is to what yeah. the reader is giving me. So you're there's an emotional map to every scene, right? Okay, great scenes are con, consist of great conflict, right? And in that, there's an emotional map to each scene. So if you don't get that emotional map, if you don't understand that, <clears throat> the casting directors know it. Right. They're looking for it. They're looking for the transitions. They're looking for that opening emotion. They're looking to see, if they give you seven pages to come in on, mm -hmm. they're looking to see if you can turn the corner, if you can you carry this character through that all arc. the way yeah. through. Now, <clears throat> that sounds like a, kind of like an ideal situation. Have you, have you been in situations where, say, you know, say the writing isn't really that good, mm -hmm. but, you know, that it still might be coming from a production that, you know, that does have funding, that does, you know, whatever, that's obviously getting made, um... What are the challenges of that? Like when you well, uh, you know what I've, I've learned something the hard way. Um, I try not to judge the material, and I'll tell you why. I went into an audition a few years back, maybe around six years ago, maybe five oh. or six years ago, and I walked in, and it was a cold read where we didn't get the script in advance. Okay, so you had to go in, you had to take the sides, go outside for half an hour and work on it, and then come in, which I absolutely hate. <laughs> I think it's the biggest disservice to an actor, but it's even a, a bigger disservice. To the producers and director trying to make a decision on an actor, how do you how do you not give an actor the opportunity to prepare their best performance? You know, you know, it's funny. A lot of actors would agree with that, and they seem to say that. But yet, you have producers and direct even directors out there that that still don't adopt that idea right. that they're that that's actually setting people up for failure. Exactly, and that's why SAG requires that you get the script in advance. Okay, you know. So, uh, but. But anyway, going back to what I was saying, <clears throat> I went in and I picked up the sides, and it was, I'm not, I mean, obviously I've had, as, as my characters have had to you know, drop the F-bomb and, right, you know, right, right. do all those things that bad guys do, because I'm right. usually cast as a bad guy, <laughs> but this one particular script I was looking at, I'm going, I don't, this is really uh, over the top, like vulgar, you know, yeah. and, I'm, and I always, and, and, and maybe, you know, I was just kind of thinking, I don't know. I don't know. This writing is weird. This is a weird thing. Uh, I don't get it, you know? Uh -huh. So bottom line was, after about a half an hour of me trying to figure this out and really not being very impressed with the writing and the material, mm -hmm. I bailed. You know, I went in and I said, you know what? I'm not really interested in the material. I appreciate the opportunity, but, you know, thank you. So oh. I left. Okay. <clears throat> Turns out a friend of mine got involved in the production because he knew the director. And he got a role in this film. And then, a few, um, quite, a, quite a long time later, maybe a year and a half, two, maybe three years later, yeah. I wound up seeing the film. And you know, it was a pretty good film. It was very different. Yeah. My friend did a phenomenal job in his role. You know, it was hilarious. It was, it was a part comedy, part sort of action, goofy type mm -hmm. thing. But... You know, and after that, I said to myself, "Wow, I really misjudged this project because I didn't see the whole project. I was only right. looking at those two pages, and it right. was not nothing that, that I liked." So I, I'm trying to force myself not to judge the material if it's if I think it's bad writing. It, you know, it might only be bad writing for those two pages because right. it's supposed to be. Right, and things <laughs> things change too. I mean, you hear all the time about how you know once filming begin. Again, sometimes, you know, things change drastically. Right. There's rewrites all the time. Oh, sure. And even when actors get on set, you know, they bring something that, you know, the writers or the directors hadn't thought about right. that actually improves a, a, you know, a situation that you can't really foresee coming by looking at a side. Exactly. Right. So, I mean, I guess that's the lesson that you're saying, that, yeah. you know, to take that with you and not, right. not judge it by, you know, the initial co right. cover that you're seeing. Um, okay, so that, that that has led you to you know become a better uh, auditionee, right? Right. So um, obviously that's led to some really good things for you. You've yeah. been in, uh, the, I, I think on your IMDb, there's something like 16 film projects that you've been in, um, from yeah. uh, ranging from shorts to films. Right. Um, I myself did not even realize that until mm -hmm. I did a little research for this interview. Um, but you know, talk about um, you know some of the more recent things you did, like okay. as far as like. Uh, you know, bigger projects that, right. you, that you're proud of or that you know that you want to share with us. And so, um, well, <clears throat> I think the biggest thing that, that that I've done was working with Kevin Hart in Think Like a Man Two. Uh -huh. We had uh, two days on set, 
and it was a blast. Uh, Kevin's a sweetheart. All the guys that, that were in that movie were great. I played their jail guard. And um, that was that was a, f a really fun shoot because they were really great people. Mm -hmm. um, most uh, The guy that I had the most contact with that the, when we were actually shooting the scenes was Roman E. Malco, who did something um, really, really generous, which you rarely see. But when it happens, it's, it's truly a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. um, if people go on my IMDb and they watch my feature film reel, I think the opening scene I'm with Michael Madsen we did a movie called Dirty Dealing 3D I remember but the that. second scene is where uh, I'm putting the guys in jail oh. um, or the way the order is you'll see me shut the door and Romany did, did something really cool and I thanked him for it on set he saw that I was behind him there was the, the jail door mm -hmm. and, he was in, and he was in front of me and then at, he was the last one so I shut the jail door well he saw that the camera was in front of him, mm -hmm. and he was in front of me. So when I shut that door, he turned to the side and gave me a look, because the door slammed, yeah. and gives me a look, opening up the camera to me to give him a reaction, Okay, which I did. Yeah. And people that went to see the movie when they first, um, when it first came out in June of 2014 I was getting messages from people great look you know <laughs> the, the look I gave the guy yeah. but that was that only that wasn't in the moment thing wasn't scripted no right. that happened right there but it was because of uh, you know Romani's generosity that that happened yeah. which is phenomenal so he helped create that beat in the he, yeah he, he helped stuff. absolutely to create that so um, that was the biggest experience I've had but working with Michael Madsen was great we had a nice yeah. Long chat on set. Really enjoyed my time with him and C. Thomas Howell, yeah. as well. But the thing that uh, I'm really excited right now is we, I just finished filming this past November. In uh, we did a film called Mr. Invincible. I had gone down to L. A. for an audition. Yeah. Um, <laughs> started driving home from the audition in rush hour traffic on a Friday. Right. Coming out of L. A. Yeah. I get to <laughs> San Bernardino and get the call for the call back. The next day, oh, so I got to find a hotel room. I got to find underwear. Right. I got to go to Target and buy underwear and deodorant, and um, get a hotel. Go back the next day for the callback. Did the callback, then got the call a few days later that, that got the role. So it's called Mister Invincible, uh -huh. and what's exciting about it? It's it was produced and directed by the team that runs the Cinequest Film Festival in San Jose, which is one of the largest in the world. Mm -hmm. It's really huge, and it happens every March. And they have a company, there's a subsidiary company called Maverick Studios. Uh -huh. And um, what's exciting about this project, first of all, it's an award-winning script. It's a sort of a romantic comedy chase adventure. Mm -hmm. And um, it's an award-winning script, as I said. But what's really exciting is that we're using a new technology, which I didn't know until I you know, got the part and started to research some stuff, and they were telling me about it. But um, there's a new screen technology you know how IMAX is a screen technology? Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a new one coming out called Barco 3D, or excuse me, Barco Escape. Okay. So what that is, it's a three-screen technology. So you have your normal center screen in the middle of the theater, and then mm -hmm. there are two screens on the side at a 45-degree angle. So you're literally sitting in the environment of the scene you're in. So it's kind of like a 180-degree view of the, Yeah, sort of, yeah. It's, it's like, yeah. I liken it to how, you know how surround sound Right, is right. I call this surround scene, okay. you know that type of thing. Now, how does that work in the theater? Is that is it actually three separate screens? It's actually three. Yeah, the one, the, like... the uh, theater itself has to be retrofitted with those extra screens. Okay. So right now, there's about a hundred uh, theaters in the country that have that Barco Escape screen available, and so the whole film was shot using Barco Escape technology, and it's a seven to one ratio. Oh my goodness! For those techies out there, yeah, that, yeah. you know that's. He, it's really wide. Yeah. So, so um, three separate cameras? Is that what's going no, on? No, no. It's, it's one camera. It's a specific lens that they use, okay. but it's how they do it in post and everything yeah, else. Yeah. So every time we did a scene, we had to shoot it with the two different lenses. One would be for the Barco and one would be for standard because, you know, eventually the movie's going to go to streaming or DVD right. or whatever and you can only see that in standard. 
So anyway, so it was a blast. We we filmed in San Jose, Oakland, San Francisco, and our final my final scenes were in Reno. Mm -hmm. uh, if people are seeing my Facebook page, my my cover photo is the very last shot with me holding the gun because oh, I'm yeah. trying to kill the good guy. I'm trying to kill the hero, and he's Mr. Invincible because he can't die. Oh, I see. Okay, I see. so okay. I, but I don't know that. I'm just trying to kill the guy. So um, so what's it like filming a movie basically twice? Uh, well, it's 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 really no different because you're always doing repeats of your scenes. Right. You know, you're doing a master shot, you're doing a, a two shot, a you know, a medium, and then a close up. So mm -hmm. you're always doing the scene over again. You know, so um, yeah, so it's it's no different. It really, it, it really wasn't different for me. It was it was. I think the biggest difference was blocking the scene uh -huh. because sometimes sometimes uh, like if we were in the if we were in the barco mode, mm -hmm. and I was sitting on this couch, it, with using the barco lens, I might be sitting over there, and you're over here, let's say. Yeah. So I might be there, and you're here, and that's for the barco lens. Because on camera, when you get to the theater, I'm going to be on the left screen, and you're going to be in the middle. Gotcha. So now when they switch the lens to go to the standard format, mm -hmm. I would sit here, and you'd be there. And it, that doesn't create any sort of continuity issues? No, for, the way they the set audience, it up, the... apparently not. Really? Yeah. Interesting. So, it's called Mr. Invincible. It's going to debut at the Cinequest Film Festival this year in March, but it's only going to be about a 80 or 90% edit, from what I understand. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a closed screening, actually, um, because they're going to do a focus group and see how people react to it. Go back, finish the edit, and on August 1st, it's supposed to be released theatrically, nationally across the country in the Barco Escape Theaters, right. followed by um, direct-to-video, DVD, and streaming. Now, um, let me ask you, what's, um, you know, obviously over the last, uh, you know, two to four years, you've, you've steadily been working on more and more, I would consider, say, studio projects or uh, larger production companies. Um, you know, having been in Vegas for as long as you have and, you know, coming basically starting from scratch with, with uh, you know, the acting and all of that. And you, you've obviously run the circuit as far as the community, the local mm -hmm. community is concerned. Um, now that you're able to sort of look at it from sort of a 360 view, like coming back around to mm -hmm. it, um, what are some of the things that you would like to see happen in the local community as far as, you know, any like gaps that you see that are, presenting themselves as obstacles or things that people can learn from to mm -hmm. maybe spend more time focusing on to mm -hmm. help, you know, elevate, you know, what's happening locally in the, in the Las Vegas film community. Um, it just seems to me that there's, there's a lot of people that are really talented and it seems like, like in a lot of small communities, I, I mean, I consider Vegas a small community. I mean, mm -hmm. I've lived all over the place and I, Vegas is definitely kind of a small town to me. Um, but like, Oh, it's a big city, but it has a small town yeah, feel. Yeah, it has that. Especially when you're in the arts community. Yeah, exactly. It has that feel where you, you definitely feel a ceiling, mm -hmm. you know, in a way. So you know, what would be uh, some observations or, you know, maybe pieces of advice that, that you would think would apply to mm -hmm. the local community as far as... So probably the biggest thing that jumps out at me from that question is basically involves the experience I had on my first two films. And that is, is that... Um, there wasn't a lot of pre-production planning, and it resulted in bad audio, mm -hmm. and it killed a couple of projects. Uh, I can remember that one of the first films I did literally wound up in post-production, I think two to three years, yeah. because of bad audio. Is that because of having to do ADR and all of that? Yes, kind of all of that stuff, and the ADR. You know, people who never who have never done ADR. ADR comes easy for me because. It's sort of like what I used to do as a singer in the recording studio, right, having right. to double my own voice, right, right. you know, that type of thing. Right. So, um, but it, yeah, it, I think if we're talking to filmmakers, I think my best advice um, or where I see the biggest amount of gaps is really spend your time in pre-production thinking about not just the fact that you need a good mic and a good recorder, mm -hmm. but the, really thinking about sound design. Yeah. What is the audio design going to be? We live in an area where the air traffic is all over the place, okay? And because it's a valley, from an audio perspective, you're, you're always going to get it. You're getting it. If you're mm -hmm. in Henderson, you're getting it at the Henderson Airport. If you're anywhere in the valley, pretty much, you'll get McCarran. If you're north, you're going to get north Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just all over the place. 
So really think about your sound design, mm-hmm. you know. Or I was observing that basically, uh, you know, I think a lot of, you know, I don't know if it's just young filmmakers, I would say new filmmakers, because I even think it's myself sometimes, and I'm a little bit older, that, you know, yeah, seasoned, you are. seasoned actors, better actors, you know, uh, might be inaccessible, that you have this perception that they're out of reach, mm-hmm. you know. Well, I, like I said, a lot of um, filmmakers may have that thought in their mind, they, maybe they hesitate. Um, and again, going back to what I had said a little earlier, that's when a qualified casting director will help out sometimes. Maybe they can exert some influence over somebody if they really think it's a great project. But the other part of it, too, is, um, you know, I know a lot of great actors who will do projects based on the fact that they really like the material. The material, like, And that's one of the reasons that I got interested in the Netflix project. Mm-hmm. The material is really good. Um, so... That's one of the reasons that we're doing it. But one of the other issues that I think comes up a lot of times uh, between actors and filmmakers is compensation. Mm -hmm. We're always being asked to work for nothing. And a lot of times we're being asked to work for nothing when the crew is being paid. Mm -hmm. Okay? I get that. I understand it to a degree. Um, But one of the things I would encourage filmmakers to offer is deferred compensation. I think any honest filmmaker should have no problem in offering a deferred compensation package yeah. for someone. Because um, unfortunately, there have been instances in the past mm-hmm. where films have been made, actors have not been paid, um, and then, unknown to the actor, that producer or filmmaker takes that film, repackages it, retitles it, and sells it overseas. I had a, a guy in L.A. tell me that, that one of the films he did was repackaged. The filmmaker made a quarter of a million dollars on that sale. Mm-hmm. And this actor got nothing. And that's such a simple contract step to yeah. take. You know, to... Just get it in writing, deferred compensation, yeah. Yeah. That, that if that film or that project gets sold by any means, whether it's retitled, mm-hmm. you know, whatever the situation is, that, yeah. that you get that. So... If there are actors out there looking at this, you know, find out about deferred compensation. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about like set etiquette and uh, you know casting. You know, when you're in a casting room, you know, auditioning, um, just do's and don'ts kind right. of thing. You know, from experiences that you've had. You know, that... well, you know, one of the things that jumps out at me when you mention that is the role of the assistant director and how important it is because actors need to understand that there is a there's an etiquette to communicating on set. Mm-hmm. And I have seen ADs flip out because someone didn't go through them first. Okay. Mm-hmm. In other words, if I as an actor want to communicate something to the director, really the proper way to do that is to talk to the AD. Okay. If a crew member or somebody in the crew like the sound person or boom operator mm-hmm. is making a change on something, they need to tell the AD so the AD can, you know, right. give everybody a time out. Right. Uh, the AD is probably maybe the most important person on the set in some regards because all communication should go through him mm-hmm. because he has to know what's going on every minute. It's, his, it's the AD's job to make sure that they're making their day. And what that means is that they are completing their shot list in the time allotted. Mm-hmm. Okay, because if they don't, then the line producer is going to be on them, so forth and so on. Right, right. So for actors and young filmmakers, I would strongly encourage you to understand the roles of each crew member, what their responsibilities are, yeah. and understand that there is an etiquette on set on how to communicate with people. Yeah. Uh, and speaking of etiquette, another, another part of the equation is to understanding that there's an etiquette in the casting room. So um, we just, in fact, we had this discussion this week in, in, in class. Um, and this came from, uh, the first time I heard this or learned this was from a casting director named Sherry Rhodes. Now, Sherry um, has since passed, but she was the location casting director for Breaking Bad. Mm-hmm. By that I mean she lived in Albuquerque. So if you were an Albuquerque actor and you were auditioning for Breaking Bad, you went to her office. But she also managed all of the video auditions Mm -hmm. for any actor who was going to audition for Breaking Bad if they weren't in L.A. 
So she would get the submissions from Dallas. Mm -hmm. She'd get the submissions from Vegas. She'd get the submissions from Denver, wherever. Mm -hmm. And she would review them. But we brought her to Vegas um, a while back to do a casting director workshop. And it was really interesting. It was the first time I had heard. I mean, I knew some of this, but not all of it. So casting director room etiquette. Number one, actors do not smoke before you go in there. If you're nervous and you have to go outside and have a cigarette, don't do it. Um, Why is that? Because it's just because it's going to smell on your clothes. Oh, you're going to walk in and you're going to bring that cigarette with you. Yeah. Okay. Number two, no perfume or cologne. Okay. Um, people are allergic to stuff, and you walk in and you don't know that. And, you know, casting director is not going to be able to watch you perform because they're going to be sneezing. Right. Right. <laughs> and a lot of times they're sitting in that room for hours. Exactly. And, and people, those rooms so. are very confined spaces. Yeah. A lot of times you wouldn't yeah. believe. I mean, I went in for a, a Jane the Virgin audition in L.A., and I couldn't believe the room I was in. It was literally in a trailer in a tiny, tiny, tiny room. Wow. <laughs> um, so, yeah, no, no perfume, no cologne. Do not go in and attempt to shake their hands unless they offer you their hand. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, because they just don't do that. They're, they're seeing 75, 80 people a day. They're not going to shake your hand. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, and just respect the fact that they have a, a really hard job to do, and their time constraints, especially on episodic network television, are brutal. I know a major casting director who decided that for him, you know, he handed over the network television stuff to one of his associates or partners, and he said, oh, "I'm just doing feature film. That's it." I'm because uh, he couldn't. It was crazy. It's too much to go through. Episodic television is crazy. So understand that they have a very hard job to do. And the time frame that, in which they have to do it is really constrained. So uh, that's important, I think, to know that. Um, go in and just be professional, you know, um, and have the right attitude. Don't ever go in whining or complaining that you just got the scene or anything like that. Don't do that. Because right. okay. that's everybody. Because that's everybody. Everybody just got the scene. Or right. complain <laughs> that, you know, how bad traffic was on the way. Right. Or, right. You know, you didn't have time to do it because you had to take your dog to the vets. Right. <laughs> you know, right. just don't, just walk in, be very professional, have, you know, have some class, walk in, do your job, nail the scene, mm -hmm. and get out. And I joke with Jay Haran about it. We, we, we call it uh, the masked man. I, I say, I tell him, I says, when you leave that casting room, when you leave the audition room, you want them to say, who was that masked man? <laughs> you know, keep the mystery. That's another thing. Right. Keep the mystery about, don't be so bubbly and open about who you are and all that. Right. Just go in, in in the general mood and tone of your character. Listen to their instructions. Perform your scene and leave. And forget about it because you got no control over anything else. Right, right. That's it. So th that kind of falls in line with, you know, I think we've all heard, you know, People say you got to go in like you don't care. I don't know how true that is, but it's not that you don't care. It's, it's that I think it's just an understanding that you have no control over the outcome. So go in and have fun. Yeah. Look at it as, a, as an opportunity to act, to perform, to make a great impression on a lot of people, um, and to collaborate. Even you know, and, and sometimes in the in the best auditions I've had. It's been a very collaborative thing, you know, where we walk in and, and you, do, you do the scene the way you're prepared, then you might get a redirect, mm -hmm. which is always a good sign if you get a redirect, um, because they're wanting to see, can this person take direction? So you should welcome that moment. Oh, definitely. Of at if it. somebody asks you to do it differently, don't think that you did something wrong in the way you did it. Right. They're just trying to find out, can you take direction? What's your range like? Yeah. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and do you understand little nuances about acting for the camera, yeah. things like that. One of the things I've had done to me several times is I've had the act or the director or casting director come in and do a scene, and they go, great, that was great. Um, could you do me a favor? I want you to do it again, but this time do it as if you're drunk. Mm -hmm. Now, the scene isn't calling for you to be drunk, right. but they just want to see you do it. And I caution people, don't go over the top with it. You know, just make it subtle, you know, because that's what they're looking for. They <laughs> yeah. want to see that you understand that it isn't over-the-top drunk stuff, you know. So be ready for that, you know. Um, and for, from the filmmaker's side, I would beg them, please don't give us cold reads. 
Yeah. You know, let us have time to prepare a scene. Right. There's a there's a system that we actors use to break down a scene, and it's not 15 minutes of looking at something. Mm -hmm. You know, like as I mentioned earlier, I spend at least four to six hours on a scene, right? Breaking it down. Well, the breakdown process is probably about 45 minutes or so, or an hour. But then now, after it's, I've done the breakdown, I have to sort of learn that breakdown and, mm -hmm. and get all that stuff right. to make it automatic, you know? So you think that, would, that like, it, it would be better for the filmmaker to see it as an opportunity to get the best out of the actor yeah. by providing more content to right. them to, to actually do work as opposed to let's judge them by how quote unquote good they are by what can they bring to the table if I give them nothing exactly like as a measure of like well this person's talent is only as good as what they can invent by you know coming to the scene and, with and very little you know you, you, you're triggering <clears throat> something here that's never brought up from the from the filmmaker's perspective and the actor's perspective you know there are some actors who have day jobs and they have to take time off Mm -hmm. to go to an audition and that costs them money mm -hmm. okay and sometimes their schedule isn't so flexible but but boy they're they're really good at it they're good actors they're good people mm -hmm. and they're working really hard to get better every day and let's think about a person's time mm -hmm. you know why would you waste time to bring an actor to an audition force them to do a cold read bring them in to do their reading and then explain to them that everything they've done was wrong because you, the filmmaker, didn't give the, give them the information. Right. And now do a whole redirect where that actor may even have to leave the room to think about the redirect for another 15 or 20 minutes. Right. And again, from the filmmaker's perspective, please give us the whole script right. so that we can see everything and how it lays out, you know, how the story lays out. Yeah. Um, and I think that's just going to make for a better overall film community if everyone can get on board with the respect for each other's time the respect for process mm -hmm. and the respect for set etiquette and casting director room etiquette yeah. get all that going we'll get a nice film community going here yeah we have one now there's some good filmmakers here now there's, there's some very talented people you know and it just needs to get that extra lift so that you know we can we can get called upon when L.A. does come here to film. Right. Which is uh, becoming more and more frequent. It is yeah. because of the Film Incentive Program, which people right. like Josh Cohen uh, have worked on so hard and got through the legislature. Mm -hmm. Las Vegas has that thing where, like, everything feels like it's within reach, if only. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah. It's, That's I, a good I, way to put it. Yeah, I mean, I because mean, I'm an outsider. I, I moved here two years ago, and I, I, people that know me know that, but... But they should know you moved here from L.A., so you, you've already been in L.A. Right, yeah, yeah. I mean, from the East Coast to L.A. Yeah. for a couple of years and then coming here as well. So, And I've, you know, I, I, I think I've, I'm able to look at Las Vegas as an outsider and mm -hmm. not be biased about it and be able to look at it and say, you know, for the good and the bad. You right. know, say, look, wow, there's a lot of really great things here. And there's, you know, a couple of things that need a little work. Right. You know what I the mean? The greatest so, thing to yeah. me is the weather. We can do a lot of exteriors all year long. I'm surprised that people don't, there's not more yeah. production going on all year. Long. Right, exactly. Yeah, I never understood that. You know, well, coming from the East Coast like we have, I mean, come on. I mean, it's like yeah. you where you literally can't do anything right. for six or seven months. You know, and, the, and, and and this doesn't have to play as Vegas either. You can you can use any desert city to be this environment. Just right. don't shoot the strip. Well, the, yeah, that's the other thing too is that people don't realize. Phoenix, Al, but this could be New Mexico. Right. My film, uh, Power Play, the, the one I've been trying to produce for five and a half years, yeah. is set in New Mexico. And I was originally very intent on filming there. Yeah. But, uh, or part of it there anyway. Mm -hmm. There is one scene that has to be filmed there. But, um, you know, as I drove around the valley, there are areas that, that I mean, like the Lone Mountain section of yeah, the I valley. Yeah, live right near there. Yeah, right? is a really cool area to where, where sort of the strip is sort of blocked out by the mountains. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. In certain parts of that area. Yeah. And boy, you'd think you were, you were in Albuquerque. There's a know? lot of places like, like, you know, not being somebody who's from Vegas, you know, when it, before I came here... Um, you know, I was moving from Los Angeles, as you pointed out, and I remember distinctly feeling like you will never catch me dead in Vegas. I'm never moving to Vegas. There's no way. You have this sort of like stigma about like what it's like and what the community's like. But then when you get here, you realize that about 
85 to 90 percent of what your perception is is actually is just incorrect exactly it's a completely right. false. well you know sin city right but to, but as you pointed out like that's such a small portion of the city you know mm-hmm. it's the strip as you said and like that's yeah. that's what it's gets a the six most, mile portion of the right, whole city gets that that's what gets the most uh, media attention and there's this entirely other world right. that is here like i've gone out and you know gone in different locations and uh as you said and it, you cannot tell that it's Vegas. Like you would swear that. Uh, well, this looks very much like something that was in Los Angeles that mm-hmm. I've definitely seen. Right. You know, some of the back alley streets and that kind of stuff, right. or the industrial sector that is here. Yeah, like industrial sector. We got old Henderson. Right. You yeah. know, downtown uh, Vegas. You can you can co- sort of yeah, like certain I, streets I know the, and alleys that look, right. You could you could almost be in New York. Exactly. <laughs> it's, exactly. When we were doing, uh, I think it was the. Uh, I want to say it wasn't. It wasn't the second reel. But it was. It was part of the reel for Jay, and uh, you know we were filming at night uh, down by the the railroad tracks and the parking garages and all that stuff. And it was the kind of location where, although we were shooting for Vegas, I remember between uh, takes, you know, looking off, off to the side and mm-hmm. down into the industrial sector there and thinking. There's no reason this location couldn't pass for, you know, say Chicago right. or, you know, like something like that. Like, it's so easy to do. And yeah. it's like, you, I, I often wonder, you know. Especially if you're using, um, uh, you know, shallow depth of field. Right. Right. If, if you're focused, you're doing a medium shot on somebody who's talking and right. you have the city lights in the background. That's right. in soft focus. Right. That can look like anywhere. Yeah. It's, it's relatively easy to do. And I often wonder, you know, again, being an <clears> outsider, you know, um, when you start to look at a lot of the local productions and local films and stuff you wonder i mean you know you start to see the same location after look it's the same right. thing over and over and over like everybody uses the same sort of token location and you start to wonder why are they doing that right. like there's so many other places here that could be used that, to actually tell the story right. or serve a story even better than mm-hmm. what they're doing now it can't be because they don't know that they're there right because these people, some of these people have been here for you know years and years. Yeah, and I mean, you can go up on Mount Charleston, or even halfway up Mount, Mount Charleston. Mount Charleston is yeah, exactly. You know, like that I, type of thing. Um, yeah, I've Sandy Valley is a beautiful place. Yeah, you and, know, gorgeous. I know. I've I've lived on the East Coast as you know for for a long time, and uh, that's the one thing I noticed about Mount Charleston is that you could literally drive literally thirty minutes to Mount Charleston, and you would not be able to tell the difference between. Uh, being there and being in like northeast Pennsylvania, right? Exactly uh, on the east coast. Yeah, right? you know what I mean. It's area, like, yeah. you, it or looks, Denver, it looks the, the, you know, the same. Rocky yeah. yeah, and it's thirty minutes away from yeah. even the like furthest place in uh, <laughs> Las yeah. Vegas, and it's like there's all these like great opportunities to do uh, some interesting things, and I I would love to see more people uh, challenge themselves right. to do that. I think a lot of really interesting films and stories could be told if people just sort of expanded their uh, their perception of what right, Las and that, you know that to goes offer. to whole, the whole thing about designing your movie. Design. Reproduction is so important. Yeah, you know, so that's okay. about it. I mean, yeah, I can't I think, think of nothing else. We talked about a lot today, so <laughs> I, I think the actually, I think we'll probably end up wait. Wait a minute. You had mentioned that you're going to interview more professionals, right? Oh yeah. Okay, yeah. so can I ask you a question? Sure can. Why are you inviting Ward Wallace? <laughs> you know, it's funny you say that because he asked me the same question when I asked him, and uh, you know, I, I had to point out to him his his IMDb resume and like stuff that he's done, and uh, he was like, you know, oh yeah, you're right. I have, you know, it's, and he's I, he sort of had. So he asked, he sort of said, why me? Oh, he literally asked me that question. He was like, why on earth do you want to me to come and do this? And like I was stupid for asking, and then I had to point out to him, you know, the work that he's done, right. and there's a certain kind of quality to the work that he's done yeah. that. And, and you, know, you know certain productions that he has done, and he's like, oh, now I get it, I understand, and it's I, you know, he doesn't realize that he's actually one of these people that is, you know, part of like the select few, right. if you will, you know what I mean? So. He, uh, I'm just kidding, all kidding aside, when I joke about Ward, we joke about him all the time. He ha- always comes to the audition well prepared, and he's got that great combination of a great look, you mm-hmm. know, for for those certain. Roles that that only he can do. Yeah, um, he's got a great work ethic. Great too. work ethic. Yeah. Uh, he knows the, he knows the process. Yeah. Well, yeah. great. Um, well, I think that about wraps it up. You know, thank you for coming down and talking with us. And, and uh, you have a deferred count for me, right? Oh yeah, I've got some pizza in the microwave right now. It's going to be about five minutes, and uh, you'll be <laughs> you'll be ready to go. Well, we look forward to talking to you again. Maybe next year we'll you know have some great things to talk about. Cool. You know, yeah. Hopefully. Hopefully Mr. Invincible will be a huge success. (laughs) I won't be accessible to you. (laughs) Well, we could only hope.
All right. Like I would help. Thanks, Toby. Yes, thank you. Yeah.